knife has a straight edge on it, so it's very easy. And maybe in our world here, there lives a happy little mountain. Welcome back to my channel if you're new here. My name is Caitlin. I upload a whole bunch of different types of videos on this channel, mostly surrounding sort of true crime, mystery, uh, psychological experiments, anything along those lines with a little bit of like lifestyles bringing in there whenever I can. So um, today I'm back discussing another sort of unsolved case that I haven't done in a little while. I've been sort of introducing some new content into my channel. So I'm back with an unsolved case that I personally have never heard of but um, it's actually really quite shocking and it's kind of heartbreaking to hear how it ends. So today we're going to be discussing the case of Annie Laurie Heeren who was kidnapped actually and um, was never returned. So if you want to hear a little bit about all the details of the case then keep on watching and we shall just get started. So Annie Laurie Heeren was the 72 year old wife of a man named Robert Heeren and he was basically a very successful businessman. Very, very wealthy. He worked as a stockholder in Trustmark National Bank. So he dealt with kind of a lot of high up clients and he did a lot of work. And so as a result was a very wealthy businessman. He was estimated to be worth around $500 million, which is insane. So you can kind of get an idea of how important he was in his job. He also partially owned a business called Mississippi Valley Gas. So again, he kind of had, um, his toe dipped in a bunch of different things. He owned a few companies or partially owned a few companies. So uh, he was very good at what he does. In 1940, Robert married Annie, who was 24 years old at the time. And they decided to move to a place called Jackson in Mississippi. So this means that when she was kidnapped, they had been married for 48 years. So they had been in each other's lives for, so for the majority of their lives. And it's so heartbreaking again, just hearing everything about this case. So on July 26th, 1988, Robert returned home one day from work, uh, expecting to come home to his wife who had plans to be there that day. She'd met a few friends in the house and um, she wasn't supposed to be anywhere else, but he came home to find no sign of her whatsoever. And so obviously called a bunch of her friends, families, in hopes of sort of her being one of them, considering she was 72 years old. So it was likely that she would be with a friend or family member or she would have at least told them of her plans that day, but none of them had seen any sign of her none of them knew where she was and so this is obviously when he realized that she was missing so once he had called the police and reported her as officially missing uh, investigators came to the scene and they found a few things not much it wasn't like um, the house was ransacked or anything but they just found some blood smears on the carpet as well as on the front door there was like a blood smear or a splatter or something they interviewed a few neighbors that had sort of gathered around um, the house when they realized that all these police cars were there and a few of them had reported seeing this van with Florida license plates, so that's important. So this van they'd never seen before, it had Florida license plates and it was kind of hovering around Annie's home um, sort of early that day, it was spotted a few times driving past. So back to the blood, they weren't able to conclusively um, identify whether the blood belonged to Annie because obviously they didn't really have anything to compare it to, but all they could do is uh, conclude that it was matching Annie's blood type. So in all likelihood, it belonged to Annie. There wasn't enough blood to sort of suggest that she'd been really, really badly injured, like lethally injured, but uh, it was only a little bit. So it was kind of though like a minor injury and someone had smeared it on their way leaving the house. There was also a ransom note that was found by the front door. So obviously this points to a kidnapping or an abduction. And this note was very, very strange. It was written on a typewriter, so obviously it's harder to like trace because you can't do any sort of handwriting analysis on it. Um, and it was also full of quite a lot of like spelling errors and grammatical errors. If I can try and find the full ransom note, like a copy of it online, I'll try and leave it down below. But I really struggled to find the entire thing. All I could find was sort of paraphrases of it. So I've got one quote here that's kind of like, not yeah i suppose the most important part that kind of you guys need to know to understand the case a little bit so some of it won't really make sense but i'll read out the quote for part of the note to you now and i'll explain a little bit about it afterwards so the note said mr robert heron put these people back in shape they was in before they got mixed up with school pictures pay them whatever damages you want and tell them this so then can know what you are doing but don't tell them why you are doing it do this before 10 days pass don't call police um, sorry, I really struggled reading that then. Like I said, it's full of errors. So it's really hard to like 
read a cohesive sentence because there aren't many. So the note referred to something called School Pictures, which is actually a company that Robert Herring took over in 1980. So he took charge of kind of the larger corporate company owning the whole thing. And um, there was kind of a bit of controversy following in the years kind of following his taking over this company. The school pictures specialised in, as you can imagine, taking pictures of like school portraits for children and then putting them together in yearbooks and they did this all around the country. So they had loads and loads of franchises and branches in like loads of states. They had a lot. So the year after Robert um, took over this company, he began to sort of decide that he would need to collect any debts that was owed to school pictures, like the overall corporate branch. Um, as a result of sort of the smaller franchises not paying them enough money that they'd earn. So in total he decided to collect all these debts and he took 12 of the franchises across the country to court to sue them for all the money that they owe the overall sort of company. So yes, there were 12 lawsuits over the period of about two, three years, two years I'd say. Um, so that's a lot. It obviously came from a place where he believed that he needed the debts that were owed to him but as you can imagine it was quite controversial for those particular franchises. This ransom note demand that Robert go to each of these 12 franchises that him and his company had sued and pay them whatever money, so pay them all the money that they needed to cover the damages caused by these lawsuits five or so years earlier. The note said that he owed them this money so the way this sort of the perspective that it was given, I mean I don't know about you guys but kind of automatically reading that you assume that is likely that whoever wrote this ransom note, whoever abducted Annie, was um, someone who worked for these affected branchi franchises, franchises, and because um, it sounded like they kind of wanted revenge, it kind of seems like the place that they are coming from. But during the investigation, this wasn't seen as a confirmation, like this wasn't a given because they soon learned that all records of all 12 of the lawsuits, there's a lot of information there, um, it was all made public so anyone could access them. Um, so in all likelihood it was someone that was affected by these lawsuits doing this because they'd obviously have the most motive to, but it's not guaranteed. So after two months um, later, after Annie's disappearance, no new information came forward and they kind of, I don't think he paid the original, like paid note to the original ransom because he was hoping that police officials would be able to find a way around it. And so two months down the line, Robert went public and made like an appeal to say, you know, I want my wife back and in hopes of sort of anyone coming forward with any information. Then about eight days later after this public appeal, Robert received another letter and this one in particular was postmarked from Atlanta, Georgia, which is about five and a half hour drive away from where they live in Mississippi. So I have um, the notes written down here. So the note read, Bob, if you don't do what these people want you to do, they're going to seal me up in the cellar of this house with only a few jugs of water. Please save me. And then it was signed with uh, what was confirmed to be Annie's handwritten signature. So after receiving this letter, Robert, for fear of obviously not seeing his wife again or for fear of her coming to any harm, um, he, he did what the original ransom note said. He paid each of the 12 franchises the money that well, he was believed to owe them. And in total, he paid nearly a million dollars to them um, for these damages, but unfortunately even though he did pay all this money and followed the instructions of the ransom notes Annie was never seen again. The one suspect that was apprehended um, sort of a year or two down the line into the investigation was a man named uh, Newton Alfred Wynn and he was an attorney from Florida who had actually at the time of these lawsuits he'd run one of the franchises of school pictures that was sued by Robert. So he ran a branch in Florida and in total, he was sued by School Pictures for $153,000. So it's obviously a lot of money and could potentially damage someone's life if they haven't been wise enough to, you know, if they've spent the money or something. There were a few things that kind of pointed to him, but nothing ever was kind of conclusively agreed upon. So they found out that a few months before Annie's disappearance, he had purchased a van, which obviously this wouldn't be particularly strange in any sort of investigation this wouldn't be a red flag but it only became a red flag when they realized that the description of the van that he bought a few months before Annie's disappearance matched the the van description of um, all the witnesses that had said they'd seen a van lurking around uh, Annie's house so this immediately linked them together and if you remember one of the witnesses said that they saw the van that had been lurking had Florida license plates and obviously Newton Wynn was from Florida. Two other neighbours came forward and said that they'd actually seen this van here before, um, before that day, kind of in the month or so leading up to Annie's disappearance. 
they'd seen this van kind of lurking around and so it became more and more likely that he'd been here before and he was planning to kidnap Annie for quite a while. Investigating further into Wynn, they contacted a paralegal who actually confessed to um, having kind of a suspicion of Wynn. They'd said that Wynn had come to them and asked them to create an alibi for him on the day of Annie's disappearance because he didn't want anyone to find out where he'd actually been on that day. Soon after this, the FBI were actually contacted by a woman who said that she'd had this encounter with Wynn. So she claimed that Wynn had come to her and offered her $500 if she would fly to Atlanta, Georgia and post a letter from him from there, which obviously if you remember that second note that Robert received was from Atlanta, Georgia. So she agreed to do so and he gave her this, uh, it was like a manila envelope and then inside was a letter wrapped in a grey handkerchief and he instructed her that she was to post only the letter inside but she wasn't to look at the letter or touch it and in order to post it she had to remove this grey handkerchief. So she did so carefully because like I said he didn't want her to touch it so when she got to Atlanta, Georgia she had to pry off the handkerchief and it was at this point that she kind of looked at the letter, she didn't really read it but she was able to then later recognise it as being the exact note that Robert received. Due to all this evidence eventually piling up against him, he maintained his innocence but he was eventually taken to court and put on trial for conspiracy to commit kidnapping, extortion and also perjury. So he claimed innocence throughout which obviously drags on the trial a little bit longer but then in 1990 he was sentenced to prison, he was sentenced to 19 years and 7 months in prison. In this same year unfortunately Robert Herring died of a heart attack, never knowing the truth about what had happened to his wife all those years before and then a year later in 1991, Annie was officially declared as dead. So in April of 2006, Wynne completed his prison sentence and was released and that was it, that is the end of the case. So to this day, there is still no sign of what happened to Annie all those years before. Um, Wynne did serve his time in jail, but he didn't serve enough time for someone who was, you know, who people were completely sure that he murdered her or anything it was just obviously they could only convict him of what they had evidence for so let me know what you guys think down below whether you think he is guilty and he was just kind of too good at hiding his tracks i think there's a lot of evidence piling up against him it seems very unlikely that it was someone else considering all of the links between like the van and things it's extremely likely but yeah let me know what you guys think below i just wanted to talk about this today because it's always heartbreaking hearing about this case where her loved ones never really got answers so like I said Robert died before he could never really know the truth about what happened to Annie on that day so that's everything I'm going to discuss today I hope you guys found this interesting and I'll see you guys soon for another video bye